Welcome to the Supercast. I'm your host, Superintendent Anthony Godfrey. Throughout the month of April, people across the country have been celebrating National Poetry Month. On this episode of the Supercast, we are celebrating as well. I had the unique opportunity to speak with Utah's Poet Laureate, Paisley Rekdahl. She shared some great ideas on how parents can support the budding writer and poet in their own children. First, let's find out how Paisley Rekdahl became Utah's Poet Laureate and where we can go to enjoy some poetry by Utah poets. Paisley, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Um, I just want to dive right in. I'm a former English teacher. I'm really quite excited to be talking with Utah's Poet Laureate. I don't get nearly the time uh, for poetry that I would like to spend reading poetry. I used to read a lot and uh, had my kids write a lot when I was teaching. Um, can you just start by telling us what first made you interested in poetry? Well, it was funny because I became interested in poetry in high school and I was not some, I didn't think I was going to be interested in poetry at all. I was more interested in visual arts. I would draw things and make maps and um, make collages. And then I was taking an English class where I'd always done really, really well. And for the first time in my life, I was getting a B. And she said, I will give anyone extra credit if they apply and they submit a poem to this citywide poetry contest. And if you win a prize, you will get you know an extra A in the grade book. And so I thought, well, why not? So I wrote a poem and it won. And I actually could not believe that it won. Um, I, I think no one could, because it was my very first poem. And I think it's probably, probably a terrible way to get started because it makes you think that poetry is nothing but awards and acclaim. So the rest of my life has <laughs> definitely like, taught me that it's not. But it got me interested um, uh, in, in the art. I thought, well, why did I win? Like, what, what did I do that was so good? And my mother was a former English major, and so she had all these books around the house. And so she just let me read whatever I wanted to, which sometimes worked out really well and sometimes didn't. That's fantastic. And I, what I love about the, that story is that it's, there was availability. There were books of poetry readily available, and so you just picked them up. I remember reading books of my parents the same way. The cover intrigued me, or the title, and I just started reading. And uh, I think that's, that's an important point. That's one of the reasons to have books in the house, for sure. Yeah. Right, right. I'm going to tell my wife that because she really would like me to get rid of more of my books. No, you I never know. You never know what's going to happen. You know, kids get, you know, so sucked into all of these books. And it's true. It's, sometimes it's just the cover. Yeah. So you're a professor at the University of Utah. You're a writer, obviously, poet laureate. How do you find balance uh, between those two? And what different pleasures do you get from each of those? Well, I love teaching, actually, I really do. I don't love grading. I think everyone can agree that grading is not as fun as, as the teaching and working in the classroom with the students. But I get a lot of inspiration, actually, from some of the things that I teach to my students, some of the conversations that I have with my students. I get insights um, into the books that we're reading, things that I never would have thought of because I've got some really good students. Um, and then with the writing, I used to be better, I'll have to admit. I used to be a lot better about being able to write a little bit every day, but actually with being a poet laureate now, a lot of my time has gone into different public projects. So it's been tougher to get uh, creative time just for myself. But that said, I have to um, say some of the projects that have been offered to me were so interesting that I enjoyed doing the research and I enjoyed doing the writing. So I wrote a book length kind of multimedia poem about the Transcontinental Railroad, which Trust me, I never, ever, ever would have thought about writing unless I had been commissioned to write about the transcontinental. Well, that's the thing about a creative project is that it can open you up uh, to things that you weren't expecting would touch you. And I'm sure that happened with that project. It really did. Speaking of your writing, did your mom really meet Bruce Lee? She did. She worked in the same Chinese restaurant. Uh, oh. with Bruce Lee. Yeah. And I have a little story about that in my book that I, my mother met Bruce Lee. I mean, I thought it was so funny. My mother's Chinese American. And, you know, growing up, I thought, like most kids, that she probably was not a very interesting person because she was my mother. That's, that's the only thing I knew about her. Right. But then one night I was watching um, Enter the Dragon. I was, a, you know, a teenager. And my mom stood there and she watched the movie and she said, ah, I used to work with him. 
And I said, you worked with Bruce Lee? She said, yeah. And the best part was of the whole story, she said, none of us liked him. He was such a show off. And I just couldn't believe it. I was like, that's the big takeaway. But wow. Yeah, it was right around the time that everyone was trying to be like Bruce Lee too. Everyone had like nunchucks and were smacking each other on the foreheads with them. And yeah, it was great. <laughs> well, that uh, as a pop culture fan, I, I'm, it's just amazing that you would be sitting there watching Bruce Lee on TV and your mom says, oh, I used to work with him. Yeah. That crazy. That is crazy. Is, Did you think that crazy. maybe your mom, you know, knew martial arts more than uh, she let on when she said she worked <laughs> with Bruce Lee? Yeah. No, that never. <laughs> if you meet my mom, she fights with words. She doesn't fight with fists. <laughs> Fair enough. Words can be much more powerful. That's for sure. So t tell us what has your path been? from a prize-winning author uh, as a teenager to uh, to Utah's Poet Laureate. It was all downhill. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> so, um, well, I, I kept writing, like I said, in high school and in college, I took some classes as well. And then I thought I was gonna be a journalist. So I, I applied to, um, you know, to journalism schools. And then I applied also to go to um, a PhD in medieval studies, started thinking, oh, I'll just be a, a professor of medieval studies. But I went to graduate school and all I did was write in the mornings. I would get up at four or five in the morning so I could write for a couple of hours before I could like, you know, take the bus into school and all that sort of stuff. And, and that's when I realized that I was probably not gonna be a great scholar, but I could be a, a, a good poet. And so then I went to the University of Michigan and just kept writing and, then I had books and then I got into academia. It was sort of a roundabout career tra trajectory, but I think almost all the writers I know, we end up doing many different things and sort of fall into finally um, a job that allows us to both write and create and, and, and be supportive in the community. Tell us, what are some of your duties as Utah Poet Laureate? And what um, what are some of the unique approaches you're bringing to the position? I know you're doing some things that maybe haven't been done before. Well, my the duties that I have are to mostly go and visit K through 12 schools as many as I can around the state, and so I've been doing that, and that's just been a real pleasure. Um, just come in, bring creative writing exercises in, work with the students, talk about poems, things like that. And then basically just show them that if they were interested in becoming writers, that's possible. But each poet laureate also has um, his or her own project. And so the one I proposed was something called Mapping Literary Utah. And it's a website, it's a web archive of Utah writers past and present, and it just went live. And we're really, really pleased with this. Um, the site, is uh, mappingliteraryutah.org and on it there's like about 130 writers, storytellers, um, slam poets, uh, cowboy poets, Utah State Poetry Society people. Um, we have essays on young adult literature and Orson Scott Card and the literary legacy of Topaz. Um, we have a uh, basically all the different types of prose writers you can imagine. Uh, we've got young adult fiction writers, we've got science fiction writers, we've got playwrights. I mean, it's it's supposed to be a compendium of, of Utah writers. And um, some are deceased, most are living, and we're hoping to continue to expand that archive. So we're always asking for more people to come forward and say, do you know this person? Or let me put you in contact with someone else. And almost every day we get more people saying, I'd like to be part of this website. So um, that's really great. We, we not only have biographies of each author, we have photographs and samples of their work um, and also audio and visual stuff too. So we have Native American storytellers. You can listen to them um, performing and things like that. So we're hoping that people, you know, obviously people can't go out and, and see writers performing their work here now, but you can get online and you can get a sense of like, what Utah's culture is like right now, at least for the writers. I stopped by the website and I absolutely love it. It's so nice, right? <laughs> it is. It's very appealing visually. And I just, the variety of authors and the variety of voices that you have represented there is just incredible. And I thought, I thought, you know, everyone talks about eating local. I think we need to read local. Yeah, that, I, is a, that is a really good resource to just say, there are people around me who are authors, and 
I think that would inspire kids to feel like they can become authors themselves when people right here in Utah are so successful. That is exactly the point of the website. I mean, obviously it has historical value so that people know who was here and you know, who was producing what at what times. But the thing that's most important to me is that um, students can get a sense of the possibility of becoming a writer. I mean, when I was a kid in Seattle, many years ago when Seattle was not cool, um, I'm biracial and I was from a place that, you know, not a lot of places people wanted to be from at that time. And I wanted, when I knew I wanted to start, you know, getting into writing, my dad got me poetry anthologies and I looked at the biographies of the writers in the back and no one, no one was from Seattle. Um, and, and I thought, oh, I didn't go to Harvard. I didn't even grow up in New York. I'm doomed. I'm never going to become a writer, but I kept doing it. Um, but it would have been really great and useful to see um, an anthology or myself in some ways reflected. And that's what I'm really hoping that people get from this site, that they can go online and they can see people coming from their own communities that have made a life in literature. And that's so important. Well, I think it does a great job of conveying exactly that. And I hope lots of students, teachers, and parents will visit it. Can you tell us the, the web address? Yep, it's just www.mappingliteraryutah.com. M A P P I N G L I T E R A R Y and then Utah dot O R G. It's all lowercase all together. So, um, and if you just go to my own personal website, I link to it as well. So you can find that there. And every week um, I tweet or Facebook out a Utah writer of the week to go through our archive and sort of say, do you know about this writer? Um, take a look at this person's work, you know, and, and hopefully people will start to follow that. And Paisley's last name is spelled R-E-K-D-A-L, is that correct? That is correct. And Paisley, just like the print, P-A-I-S-L-E-Y. So it's just paisleyrectal.com. Yeah. And uh, you can find a lot of great resources there, too. I mm -hmm. love that website, and I'm going to spend a lot more time there, and we'll, we'll be promoting it in our district, sending that out to teachers. I think it's remarkable. It's, it's, it's a really great site for anyone who has an interest in in uh, anything literary. We're going to take a quick break, but when we come back, more from Utah's Poet Laureate, Paisley Rechdahl, including tips for parents and aspiring writers. I'm Stephen Hall, Director of Jordan Education Foundation. In today's challenging and uncertain times, it is more important than ever before to support one another. Here at the Jordan Education Foundation, we invite you to join us in making sure children are not going hungry. Your $10 donation to the foundation will help us feed one student for a weekend when food and meals may be very scarce for some. With food and hygiene supplies in the principal's pantries at Jordan School Districts being depleted, and in higher demand than ever before, every financial contribution made will help us to keep the pantries filled for students who would otherwise go without. The Jordan Education Foundation exists due to the generosity of people who care about kids. If you would like to donate to help children from going hungry, please visit jordaneducationfoundation.org or contact the foundation at 801-567-8125. Thank you. Together we can make a difference. We're back with Utah's Poet Laureate Paisley Rechdahl. You, you told us that you uh, one of your main duties is to visit K-12 schools. Uh, when you visit, how, how do you engage students in poetry? Well, I try to teach poets that I think will be speaking to issues that they're interested in, in language that they themselves recognize. So even though I love John Donne and Shakespeare, I don't tend to bring in you know poets like that. I tend to bring in poets that are still alive, very contemporary, um, writing about anything from you know a tree outside the window to a TV program or music or something like that. So I want the poems to be accessible in ways that students can recognize there's their world in that poem too. And I also build creative writing exercises around the poem. I want students to not just read poems and talk about poems, but try writing them themselves. One of the great marks of fluency in a language is can you be creative in it? So, you know, getting students to play with language is actually not frivolous. It's a, a foundational way 
to get them to be fluent in their own language. That makes a lot of sense that writing can reinforce reading and just even if you don't think that the product that you create is going to be something that others want to read uh, long into the future or that will win you a local prize or extra credit <laughs> in your class, mm -hmm. at the very least you're processing and you're working with words and and that that sparks the brain and it cements some language skills that maybe um, we, we can't cement in other ways. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I was trying to do also with the students this year, and I'm, I'm disappointed again, it didn't work out. I was going to schools this spring and asking them to write um, what we call epistolary poems, little letters. And the letters would be written to a stranger. Um, because what I was planning to do is an April Fool's prank in Salt Lake City where the, um, the parking enforcement officers would deliver parking tickets, but they would be with poems, student poems. And um, we had, everybody was on board, the mayor was on board, the parking enforcement people on board, the police, everyone was on board except the lawyers. Turns out it's illegal to put any kind of flyer on a car. So unfortunately, you know, that was one of the exercises I had with the, the students. And so then I try to take those, those poems and turn them into menu inserts and obviously that didn't work either. So it's um, a lot of my best ideas this year have kind of gone by the wayside. <laughs> but I usually try to get them to at least create something that will be used in another kind of way. Um, maybe a public performance or you know something you can share with other people. It's making the poetry engaging and active and interactive uh, by putting it in a menu or putting it in a parking <laughs> ticket. Yeah, I think we have an idea that you're supposed to come across poetry in certain particular ways in classrooms and things like that. And obviously, you know, lots of cities have poetry on buses and things like that. I think we, even we do. Um, but I like the idea of just getting people to recognize that poems are really all around us all the time. And, and we don't have to treat them as these sacred or special or difficult or intimidating things. Some poems are intimidating, but other poems, you know, they're just easy and delightful. And you can have a lot of different types of relationships with poetry. You don't just have to sit there and, and, and feel like you're stupid if you don't get it. I think that's the thing that I really want students to walk away from, which is that if they see a poem, it's written in, a lang in, in their language. They can look up these words up online or in a dictionary and they can access it. It's not a riddle. It's not there to make them stupid, feel stupid. I think a lot of people feel like if they don't get it immediately, it's a sign of that, that they're not you know, up to the task. But that's really not the case. Poems ask us to spend time and slow down and read and, and savor things. So it's a different kind of reading and, and I'm hoping students feel comfortable with that. I really like the way you describe that. It is something to be savored and we're not used to that. We're used to consuming things very quickly, dropping in, getting mm -hmm. the point and moving on. And that's the pleasure of poetry is being able to sit with it and stay with it and really absorb it and understand it. But it does take time, like you said. If there is a parent out there whose child really enjoys poetry, uh, they know that they like to write, are there suggestions that you have for a child in that circumstance? And then I want to ask if it's intimidating to people, uh, what would be a point of entry for folks who are intimidated? Um, because mm -hmm. parents, parents may be looking, especially now, for a way to encourage their student who's already interested in poetry or to have a child who may not be interested to get started. With kids, actually, you know, you're very lucky, uh, depending on how young the child is, too. There's a surprising amount of children's literature and young adult literature that's written in verse. Um, Jacqueline Woodson is a very famous young adult fiction writer, and she writes a lot in verse. And it's an easy way to get students hooked. Um, you know, they're, they're reading a narrative, but they're reading it in rhyme. And, and suddenly it's, it's something that seems really natural for them. Um, the New York Times just did a whole big special on children's poetry, actually. So I think you can look that up online. I'll try and find that link and maybe send it to you and maybe you can send that out to your parents. But they just, there's like eight or 10 books that just came out. So there's, um, if you just go to any bookstore, you'll be able to find very quickly um, children's books and young adult books that are actually written um, in, in rhyme and meter with poetry. But, you know, the other thing that 
I think might be a good start for parents, depending if you're, you know, with slightly older kids, maybe high school age. Um, there's a few resources, some are free and online. Poets.org and Poetry Foundation have a poem a day that gets sent out over email. And you can, you can um, subscribe to that in Poetry Daily as well. These are three online subscription services, totally free. You get a poem in your inbox every day. And a lot of them are written by poets that are alive right now. And so you can go look up their work and, and get more of it if you're interested. A nice anthology to get might be the Best American Poetry series for a more advanced um, a high school student where you get 75 poems written by different American poets. Um, and some of them are very funny. Some of them are hard, but some of them are also like light and interesting and tell stories. And it gives you a real sense of the breadth of American poetry. If you don't like a poem, it's okay. There's so many more. <laughs> There's I, so many more. Yeah. I actually started buying the best American poetry series in college mm -hmm. because my professor said, if all you're reading are the dusty old leather tomes of the past and you think you're going to be a writer, it's not going to work because you have to read what's being published right now if you're going to have any chance of, of mm -hmm. doing that. And that concept intrigued me. And uh, I hate to admit, it seemed odd that people were still writing poetry a little bit because you think about it as something that was so much, you know, was so popular in the past. And um, I started reading that and I have every volume of that since 1987, actually. That's amazing because I'm the best American um, series guest editor for this year. My, my volume is coming out uh, in September. So I will no, I'm not kidding. I spent the last year reading for Best American Poetry, so I'm their guest editor. Yeah. Uh, oh, that is fabulous. I may <laughs> get my first autographed poetry collection if I can get to the festival in the spring. Absolutely. I'm more than happy to sign that. Yeah, no, I read so much poetry for an entire year. But I, I agree with you. When I was just starting out, even in college, I thought that I was maybe one of five poets left because no one was out there. I didn't know, I didn't know, you know, anything like that. So something like Best American Poetry was really helpful for me because it it taught me that there were people who were alive and who were writing it still. So yeah, that's the value of that. Well, and I think that's an important message for kids who are interested in poetry. There are a lot of great ways to publish poetry poetry these days. A lot of people wanting to write that. It feels like a bit of a resurgence to me, um, mm -hmm. just because there has been some best-selling poetry out there lately, and um, and that's exciting. It is. Yeah. Is there anything else that you would suggest for parents or for students who want to get started writing? Are there any activities that you can think of or ideas for maybe habits that an aspiring writer might want to uh, consider trying? I know that some authors I've spoken with will set aside time at a certain time of the day mm -hmm. and write during that time or will warm up. I know John Updike used to write reviews before he would write his own prose and poetry. Are there any habits that you would suggest students try or any activities? Yeah, so there's a couple. The first is um, poetry to me usually starts out as a kind of game. I give myself an exercise. So um, there's lots of books of poetry exercises, one by Chase Twitchell and Robin Bain called, I think the Poet's Handbook is really good. But there's another one that's even better potentially, it's called The Little Book of Poetic Forms. It's by Lewis Turco, T-U-R-C-O. And in it is just the list of every single kind of poetic form in every language across time. And what I would do when I was blocked or just wanted an exercise, I would just randomly flip through the book, point to a poetic form and say, all right, I'm going to write something, but in this poetic form. And what I mean is that like poetry is a kind of game when you're trying to think about rhymes and you're trying to think about numbers of syllables and you're trying to think about numbers of stanzas. Oftentimes we are our most creative and we have the most constraints. And sometimes playing with those constraints will push you to do something you wouldn't normally do. So sometimes telling students to go out and write a great poem, that shuts them down. But if you tell a student to go write a poem where every line, first word begins with a different letter of the alphabet going from A to Z, they usually do that one because the constraint helps them. 
So that's one thing I would suggest. And the second thing is there's lots of um, sort of fun poetic exercises that you can get off of um, the, I think it's Poets and Writers uh, magazine. They offer some free poetry and fiction writing exercises uh, uh, on each week. So you can just go on the online and look at those too. But just keeping lists, keep lists of images, take a notebook with you everywhere and just write down strange things that you see over here and then use them as a sort of starting point for speculation. You know, what is it about this image that interests you? What is it about this sound or that snippet of conversation that really attracted you? Uh, those, those are great suggestions. And I, I love the concept that constraints actually help creativity. And that when you know you're trying to write a poem within a particular form, it can spark something. Um, I, I had the, the Princeton Book of Poetry and Poetics, and I would go through and find these obscure kind of strange rhyme schemes from medieval times or whenever when there was this uh, complicated form of a poem that was written during a certain period of time. And, and I did that. I tried to write that way. And it makes you appreciate the poetry that is written in that form at a deeper level when you try it yourself too. Yeah, it does. And it, it usually means that you end up abandoning the exercise. You, you know, something else comes forward. You're like, wow, I didn't really like that form, but I did like these images. And, and I do believe that constraint is ultimately our friend. I mean, how many of us have written that paper because it's due in like four hours or something, right? <laughs> it's that sense of the deadline. Um, when you're thinking about the constraints, you're often freed up to imagine more um, fluidly, creatively, because you're just trying to to make something work that you know logic would normally defy. You know, given the times we're living in, they're very unique. Um, and this is something, it's a historical time that kids and families and people in the future will look back on. Is there maybe a starting point for kids to write a poem maybe that relates to the times they're living in right now and the things we're going through? First thing I would suggest is never tell a kid what they're doing is deep or important because I wouldn't tell an adult that either because it shuts us down. You know, when you think this, we have to write about the times that we're living in, it's it's too much. It's too much to process. I mean, we're adults and I don't know about you, but I'm struggling to process this. Um, I don't think I have a language for this. So what I usually do with students, and you know, I taught around 9-11 as well. One of the things that I did was um, ask them to keep what I would call an image journal. There's a wonderful book called The Pillow Book by Sei Shanagon, and she was a Japanese courtesan in the basically 1000 AD in Japan. And she had this book where she just recorded her impressions she kept lists of things like um, things that make your heart race, things that make you grow cold with disgust, um, deceitful things, lovely things. And she would just keep lists of these images and they were really surprising things like lovely things as a black cat with a very white belly. Um, you know, yeah. <laughs> wonderful things is the smell of, of perfume on, on old silk. You know, things like that where you're like, wow, so what I would ask students to do or a child to do is to say, can you just come up with a list of things that give you delight or maybe make you afraid and just try to focus in on an image, something that gives us a concrete sense of taste, smell, sight, touch, get them to interact with their memories in the world that way. And it's small, but oftentimes I think that it will give you a portrait of what how they see the world. I myself have been keeping lists because, I mean, for instance, now that it's so quiet, I'm able to hear bird song that I've never heard before ever. I didn't even realize there were birds around me, I guess. So I'm just writing down the sounds of things that I'm hearing. Um, and in that, I, I, I'm giving a depiction of this world. Um, yeah, I think that I would recommend trying that. The second thing I would say really quickly is, um, and this might be harder to convince your kid to do because they might not ever have written a letter before. <laughs> but um, the epistolary form of poetry, which is basically a uh, what feels like a very casual form of poetry where you basically write a letter to somebody and 
you list what it is, you tell them what you're, you've been doing and what you've been thinking and having them write a letter to someone that they miss, someone that they're not being able to see right at this moment, that might be a really good exercise for them, right? It gives them something concrete and someone concrete to imagine and to write to. How early should we try to engage students in poetry? I mean, I think as early as you can. I mean, one of the things that I notice when I go to schools is the younger the students, the more eager they are to participate, to speak, to play. And somewhere around middle school, they become really self-conscious of that. And then in high school, it really starts to divide between the students that are gonna be interested and the students that feel like this is just another joyless exercise. <laughs> and right. and I, I think, I don't know what is happening, but I suspect a lot of it has to do with the ways that students or children have a natural sense of playfulness. They love sonic rhyme and games and they love wordplay. And when we start teaching them that poetry is a riddle, that they're stupid if they get it wrong, I think it kills some of that joy. Some part of poetry is, is beyond just the an analytical. We all start naturally loving that and it kind of fades. And if we take advantage of that, you probably can't do it too early. Yeah, you can't. <laughs> my, when my youngest uh, was little, he sat on his leg for a while and it fell asleep. And he said, Dad, my leg is spicy. Yeah, and great. <laughs> I didn't know what he meant at first, but that was a, a, that was a poetic image for me. I've never <laughs> yeah. forgotten that one. Paisley Rechdahl, Utah's Poet Laureate. It's such a pleasure having you on the Supercast. And... Uh, Honestly, I'm going to look, I'm going to have to listen back and write down every book and author you mentioned because it all sounds really exciting and it's a perfect time to dive in and uh, kind of reignite um, a passion for reading and writing. Um, I would love to hear you read either one of your poems or a poem that uh, that's a favorite for you. Well, I will read a poem that I do find inspiring, if not necessarily inspirational, because I think it is it is important to find comfort in this moment and to take some sense that there's more, uh, more joy to be had. This is not by me. I'm not a terribly um, hopeful poet, unfortunately, but this is one of my favorite poems and I've uh, read it before for other people too. Uh, it's by the poet Jack Gilbert and it's from his book, Refusing Heaven. And it's a poem called a brief for the defense. Sorrow everywhere, slaughter everywhere. If babies are not starving someplace, they are starving someplace else with flies in their nostrils. But we enjoy our lives because that's what God wants. Otherwise the mornings before summer dawn would not be made so fine. <clears throat> the Bengal tiger would not be fashioned so miraculously well. The poor women at the fountain are laughing together between the suffering they have known and the awfulness in their future, smiling and laughing while somebody in the village is very sick. There is laughter every day in the terrible streets of Calcutta and the women laugh in the cages of Bombay. If we deny our happiness, resist our satisfaction, we lessen the importance of their deprivation. We must risk the light. We can do without pleasure, but not delight, not enjoyment. We must have the stubbornness to accept our gladness in the ruthless furnace of this world. To make injustice the only measure of our attention is to praise the devil. If the locomotive of the Lord runs us down, we should give thanks that the end had magnitude. We must admit there will be music despite everything. We stand at the prow again of a small ship anchored late at night in the tiny port looking over the sleeping island. The waterfront is three shuttered cafes and one naked light burning. To hear the faint sound of oars in the silence as a rowboat comes slowly out and then goes back is truly worth all the years of sorrow that are to come. That's beautiful. It is Thank a beautiful you, poem. Thank you. Thank you so much. Very it's nice. been such a pleasure talking with you, and uh, I really look forward to meeting you in person. And 
I promise you I will have a copy of <laughs> the latest Best American Poetry volume for you to sign. That's oh, that would be great. Signing. That's really exciting for me to know that somebody is going to be like, who has all of those collections will we'll be there with it. So thank you again. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure having Utah's Poet Laureate Paisley Rechtdahl here on the Supercast. Remember, visit mappingliteraryutah.org to see the wonderful website that she has created to highlight homegrown authors and poets. Thank you again for joining us. And remember, education is the most important thing you will do today. We'll see you out there.